Hello everyone, welcome to the Sweeney Show, Business and Law Podcast. I'm David Sweeney. Uh, joining me here today is Stephen Ryan. Stephen, you're very welcome. Thanks for having me, dear. Uh, Stephen is a marketing guru, marketing right. expert, specialist, uh, knowledge master, yeah. lecturer in CIT, just started up a new marketing company, yeah. a huge event coming down the tracks. I do, there's, I there's a lot of stuff, uh, no pressure there with all those terms, I suppose, <laughs> yeah. marketing guru. Well, well, firstly, yeah, firstly yeah. You're, you're very welcome. Uh, but you are, you're synonymous in Cork now with marketing, and I, I think like, you're a lecturer in CIT. Yeah, I suppose I've been a lecturer in CIT for the last kind of five years. Um, and I suppose I built my name originally, I suppose, from my time in Fota. Um, for a long time, it used to be called Stephen from Fota. And people in tourism circles would still kind of call me that. I was the head of marketing there for, I suppose, seven and a half years. And it was through that whole transition period of where Fota kind of came to life with this whole new entrance complex, then went into the Asian sanctuary. So I had a lot of nice stuff to play, but it was like a blank canvas when I went in. So the, the wildlife resort? Yeah, oh, the wow. wildlife park. That was that was where I built my name. And uh, I suppose the park went from 330,000 visitors to the kind of, to the scale it is now, where it's at the kind of 460, that mark. So the, it, it was lovely to be there was during that, that trans- uh, transition. Recession time we took yeah. there? Yeah, like yeah. A, a so role? It wasn't, it wasn't. Um, I suppose... When I went in, the park had had a bit of a hit in terms of a drop in numbers. So I went in in the end of 2008 and they had a big decision to make in terms of the board at the time had plans um, to, cr- to, to invest a lot of money, a couple of million into this brand new entrance complex. But at the same time, they were thinking, OK, we're just after being hit with the biggest recession in decades for the country. If we put all this money in, will we be able to afford to survive in the long term? But they made the bread move, Risk. went with it. Yeah. That opened in 2010. And actually, we saw our numbers increasing because we did a lot of stuff kind of that wasn't really associated with the park, put a lot of events on, um, did a lot more added value. So we didn't, want, we didn't reduce the price. And in fact, what we did was we made the brand bigger and, and probably made it seen everywhere. It was so the start of social media. Instead and all of that, selling... Like, cost or price you gave other factors yes to buy a ticket, like a doubt. family enjoyment community yeah. culture and experience yeah i mean uh, and it's still there to this day um face painting and things simple stuff like that but they're tangible things that people see like when you think about people going to somewhere like a wildlife park the initial visit for tourists is all about the animals but if you're from cork or you're maybe in the munster area Maybe after the first visit, if there's no new animals coming, you want something else. So you're, you're, you're talking about like African drumming workshops, birds of prey, flying demonstrations, all of that stuff. So we kind of made it more experiential. Uh, we introduced, say, for example, uh, the Cheetah mi- uh, Four Mile Road Race. And we brought that in in 2009. It'll have its probably 11th version of it this year, even though it's only 10 so what, years. What is that? It's a, a competitive road race that goes through the whole park um, and it's one of the most popular road races at night in Cork on the racing calendar. It's an actual competitive race and it's capped at a thousand people. But when they did the first race back in 2009, um, I had the record numbers in 20 years for a nighttime road race in Cork. There was 650 and all those people travelled for it. Um, but again, it was just that created publicity because you were, what you were doing is you were bringing people in that maybe Bring don't attention. always come to the park. Yeah. I know they said, this place looks fantastic. And that was the idea, get the talkability going. And, and did you then, like back then, did you, like social media was probably like back then, it was just like Facebook, just 2008, down. 2009, starting off Google, yeah. SEO, all that kind of stuff. People were just coming aware of it. Yeah. Did you embrace social media yeah. back then? Was it that? I, like when I went in, basically we had a basic, very, very basic website and not much going on in it. Um, there was a blog there. The first job I did, was went out to tender on creating a brand new website. And I remember always going to a talk, it was a marketing institute event. It was actually, the Elysium was only open, the while at the stage, and they had a special event to mark the Elysium. And the guy, the head, of, the head of marketing from Meteor was there. And at the time he was talking about this social media was gonna be huge. And he was saying that in particular at the time, they were spending all their money on Bebo. So this is going back yeah. now to 2008. No mention of Bebo Facebook, stars. Twitter, or anything yeah. like that. 
So I said, yeah, and then I could see a lot more people starting to use Facebook. And you watch the consumers, you see where people are going. So we started, we built a new website, we launched all our social media back in the summer of 2009. And we were probably one of the first kind of tourist attractions in Ireland to really go after it. And by the end of 2010, we were acknowledged on a national level in terms of, first of all, Falls Ireland had given us an award a business challenge award for use of social to engage with customers. The next thing we won was we won um, the prestigious Air Spider Award. We won best website in the country. We won the Grand Prix prize. And the reason that they said we beat the likes of Heineken and VHI and Discover Ireland and all that was they said we were the first organisation in Ireland to talk back. So we were using social. We were integrating it with our strategy to literally chat back if people had questions we were talking back to them. And was that someone, was that a bot, or was that actually someone at no, the other end? No, it was going, me. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I was obsessed, I, I suppose, in yeah. some ways. Yeah. I saw this thing taking off, and like even if you spoke to my wife at the time, I never switched off. Um, it was a, like a pet project. I was passionate about the place as well. So like in particular, if you think about when, when photo would be really busy, you're talking end of March to end of September. That's really the, the core, the core season you could be literally answering questions at all times, you know. Um, we got a couple of interns in every now and again, but I'd say 95% was me. Yeah, but I don't think also you can pass it off to Sorry someone because you have the knowledge. And, and it's a big mistake a lot of companies do. Um, Getting is, like a, yeah. a recent college graduate or a part-time college graduate just to answer the, the Facebook or the Messenger. Yeah. And for both parties, it's not fair because, first of all, you're expecting too much of them. And, and, and second of all... That student is then is under pressure to produce goods and he doesn't even know the business or she doesn't know yeah. the business. So they're like, oh my God, and what am you, I going to do? You as the business owner have the knowledge. Yeah. So A, you can filter through a tire kick yeah. or a time waster, but e, you can actually immediately answer a question back to someone yeah. in the way they want to hear it. Yeah, and like people are always afraid to answer back if they're junior roles because they're afraid of saying the wrong thing. And I can understand that. But like when you're a senior, so I was, I was the head of marketing in Fort, so I was one of the management team. So... Because of the nature of the park, because it was a, a large SME as such, I had a better feeling for the overall. You could be down there at the weekend and I could be dealing with a first aid, I could be dealing with, you know, lost kids, I could be dealing with car parks, yeah. all of those. So I knew hands on what this, uh, the operational side of the business. So if someone had a complaint, I had a fair idea where the root of that complaint was. Or if someone had a query about what things were happening or whatever, I knew the answer. What's what's just on, just you touched on their complaints. When you get, com like, because, it's quite as a business like yeah social media is double-edged sword it is where why we put ourselves out there on facebook and instagram there's also opportunities for people to kind of come back at you maybe like unfairly or like how how what's your advice to people to deal with those type of complaints if you have kind of not to avoid them anyway is the first review. piece of advice try where possible to, to calm them down apologize i know not every business wants to apologize but it actually might save you a lot of hassles just say I'm sorry for any hassle we have caused. Is there any chance that maybe you could send us a message or we can send a message? And in, in fact, with Facebook, it was actually harder before. It's easier now because with Facebook, for example, no, or Instagram or any of those, you can just press the message button and you're in there and you can send them a private message before you had to ask them to, se to send you the message. Businesses couldn't Correct. approach the customer yeah. first. Yeah. So that makes life easier. And I have found over the years that definitely, if you if you put the hand up and just say, look, and we'd be delighted to look in to see what happened and, and get to the core to of the problem and we come back to so you. So you don't just shut your Facebook no, off straight away no, or put no, head in sand. No. Yeah. But don't be controversial either. I mean, like, yeah. some businesses try to be controversial and it backfires on them or try to be funny or being sarcastic and yeah. things like that. I think they? you have to be respectful to people yeah. and just be yeah. genuine. You would yeah. Like how you treat a person offline, you would have to treat them on social media look, as well. I was delighted. When, before I left Fort and in, in 2016, we won a um, Car Company the year, award, year Award for Hospitality and in the video, actually, you see um, Conor Healy from the Chamber um, talking about... Called Chamber of Commerce, yeah. Yeah, um, he's talking about this idea that, you know, photo, what you see online is what you get in, in, in the park. And he said, they really, like, yeah. get that across. And, like, their, cu their customer service online is the exact same as what well, you we have. We might and actually talk about that in a minute if we start talking about Instagram and authenticity yeah. of influence yeah. and all that. But when you left, left Forte then, did you into CIT? Was no, it? What so, did you do? Uh, so after Forte then, I went, I went into another fun job. I've been lucky enough because with, before Forte, I was with Cork City for a year doing a bit of PR for them, but there was no social and stuff at that, at that stage. 
when I left for uh, um, I, I left for a head of marketing role at Red FM so I was at Cox Red FM for two and a half years so that was my next my next step and uh, very different world because you know you're going into the media business high energy high energy yeah. always moving yeah probably not as probably not as much of a chance to plan because with photo it's seasonality so it's there's a great yeah. chance in the winter to kind of sit back and say well what did we do last year what are we going to do for the year ahead with a radio station it's constantly going so it's it, it's probably like your it's probably like some retail it's that that never really stops um, so you're kind of you're creating ideas you're getting a chance to implement them and you're nearly on to your next idea before you could kind of evaluate it but um, yeah like I mean radio to me the reason why I moved into radio is I feel that there's still a huge love for that in Ireland and in particular in a place like Cork where we spend a lot of time in cars you know I know I know this is a podcast and as we get more connected we'll be listening to more of them um, but I think, that, yeah, like, yeah. But I yeah. think at the moment, there's two places w- where it's really strong, and possibly a third place. So you have your kitchen at home, which is a very old traditional thing in Ireland to do. That you, the first thing in, you do in the morning is you turn on the radio. Then you get into your car, and sometimes the reason why we, especially in the mornings, listen to radio is for functional stuff like what was the news from last night, what was the sport, the weather, traffic. what's the traffic. Yeah. All those things yeah. are important. And in a place like Cork, especially with a lot of commuters, you could be coming from Middleton, Mallow, Yall, Kinsale, or wherever, Bandon. So they're going to be spending a good half an hour to an hour in a car. So they want to be entertained, they want to be informed. So I felt that there was a huge opportunity there. And, and then to merge that kind of digital world with that kind of traditional world as well. And I think Red have done a lot of stuff. Um, I was delighted to be involved in, in some kind of little projects that we did. For example, we created another podcast, the, the Red Business Podcast yeah, with Jonathan, Jonathan Healy. Healy. Uh, we did a, a, a kind of an online TV show with Stephanie Lynch, Red Travel, um, and which they just brought out another one there recently Life with Hustle. Air France. Yeah. Life Hustle yeah. with, with Emer and, and, and Viv. Um, there's a one with the Cahoots. Um, yeah. But like all of that was kind of in the plan for a while. And it took a while. They've just launched Red Extra, but that was planned kind of last year. We were, we were working towards that goal of this kind of seamless experience, whereby if you wanted to go online, that you could kind of, as, as I put into, into words, read, watch, or listen to Red FM. So you could read some articles mm. from the news, which mainly from so the you're news you're team. merging the online yeah. world with the old school yeah. radio. Because they're more of a media company now than just a radio station. Yeah. I mean, Red FM... Like, if you think about a local radio station, they're at the heart of a lot of the big events as well because they have a physical presence. They're not just sitting online, they're actually sending red patrollers or presenters to an event, whether, you know, whether it's a business event or a fun event or a festival or whatever, they're actually there. So, you know, and I mean... But we, do, you, do you think then, sorry, do you yeah. cut you off the... You know, radio, just the day-to-day program yes. of radio is scheduled. So you have yeah. a show from the morning time from 6 to 9 yeah. or whatever, and then the 10, 10 to 11 and the lunchtime slots. Do you think that's changing with the podcast where now people can go online and get a recorded show, watch, say like they can watch John and Healy yeah. anytime or listen to it, but say the Red FM, the morning show, they maybe they want to get it later on. Or like, do, do you think the, how people are listening to radio is changing? You could see, in particular with Neil's show, the amount of people that would listen back later that night. Um, you know, he has a strong cohort. I think it's up to something like 78,000 listeners now. But, like, the amount of people that were listening, you'd have thousands of downloads of the podcast. And they weren't just from Cork, right? They were actually that, overseas as well. Do you see that happening and react to it? And do you know it? Because yeah. there's no point, like, having putting out this project 9 to 11 in the morning and then that's all your listenership, where you're now making it available for You're now making it. it available all the time. But the, the thing is, with live radio, like a show like that, you need the listeners. So there has to be always yeah. a live element. Because you, does that fit in? Then you need the advertisers. You need the advertisers it. because yeah. it's very hard to, I suppose, monetize the online world because podcasts haven't gone mainstream as of yet. They're still very niche products, yeah. um, and therefore advertisers want the big numbers. Yeah. Even though, if you thought about it, if you were, say, for example, like yourself, a solicitor, and you're trying to identify a particular business or owner. You might be better off with the small few, the 100, 200 people listening, rather than the 200,000 that maybe have no interest in what you're talking about. So that's why I think there's a, a huge... impact on that yeah, smaller and, and that's why the likes audiences. of Red Business and those type of shows will be probably a lot stronger in the future because it has a, a kind of 
a very interested audience that are engaged. And I think that's the key thing. The engaged audience is where, is where you want to be in the future. You know, particular shows on particular topics. Like they have one on, as well on just on local music. Again, it won't be everyone's cup of tea. You know, but it will be for people in that industry. For anyone that's in the music and acting, where where do you personally get your influences from? Social media, like do you, do you look to America, do you look to UK, or do you just are you self yeah. taught? Is, is is it all like it's not all theoretical or, or academic, no. is it? Like there must be something. There's there's a bit of both. I mean, if I go back on the academic side, um, somebody like Philip Kotler, who I'd feel he'd be like a godfather of marketing as such, um, he came up with a lot of the theories that 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 we'd probably use in in terms of academic references. He's from the Kellogg School of Business um, and has been around since the kind of 60s, 70s. The guy is in the 70s himself now. So he'd be one. In oh, terms, he, sorry, yeah. I, is he one of those kind of like the mad men kind of newspaper executives back in the No, back then, what, he'd be more just his? a professor that wrote a lot of books. Okay. Yeah. Um, and and do, do you think marketing is more like studying people's habits and then if you have a product or a service, look like reverse engineering it yeah. looking at the habit of the person or the need they want and then considering how do I get that product into that person's lifestyle I think it's very much about psychology yeah I think um, for years we made the mistake as, as marketeers to focus on demographics when in fact actually you should be on psychographics because um, what's the difference so to me the difference is you're, you're, you're basing it on age with demographics when actually if you think about it it's what people like and and two 25 year olds or two 50 year olds aren't actually the same so one could be into health and fitness and the other could be into binge drinking uh, one could be into cycling and could have taken up cycling or mountaineering at 50 and would be more in common with a 25 year old that has the exact same hobbies so like i mean uh, somebody that i i had a lot of time for for years but he, he's kind of gone off topic in the last couple of years but gary vaynerchuk originally i would have had a lot of time for him but no He's kind of gone too much in this hustle business, which kind of drives me insane. But originally, some of his marketing thing about marketing in the year that we live in was was really was really yeah, important because he said, okay, and he made a great point. I saw him speak at a conference in Dublin one time, and he said, he said, imagine, he said, if any of you are lucky enough to know your parents at the age you are right now, he said, I can guarantee you felt that they were older yeah. than you were. And I thought it was a great point because we have seen this generational shift whereby people have become a bit younger as they got older and if they're open to new things people hit 40 or 50 before and they were shutting off that, that was it I'm, I'm planning retirement no they're starting businesses yeah they're taking up new hobbies yeah they're they're completely changing their lives the like I, we would be huge fans of Gary Vay and Chuck yeah. because a lot of stuff does transfer to cross the many yeah. industries I think I take your point on the hustle stuff I think he's probably over posting stuff his I content so. is huge and he's spreading yeah. himself out more now yeah. he's doing wine now and all this kind of stuff yeah but like some of the nucleus of his things is, is right isn't it he's yes. in, into like build your company on building up your own house rather than putting someone else down yeah and he talks about like we're actually in uh if you agree with this or not like a revolution we're back in the 30s it was yeah. going from uh, uh radio to television yes we're now going television to phone yeah and like so that's where the attention is do you, do you find now where that your your marketing is that does that make sense that logically saying and so that you, you as marketeers and looking at like the lifestyle day to day of people that you're now tailoring your products or services to suit on and that. I think the phone is at the core of everything there's no doubt about that like we're talking about the age that we're in at the moment is this idea of a connected customer so if the core is at the heart that phone is now connecting with your car it's connecting with the fridge in some cases it's connecting with the heating, TV yeah heating Lighting, everything yeah. but at the heart of it it's usually your phone is the starting point so that's it's it's become this kind of like another a part of you it's nearly part of like your androids yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. or cyborgs yeah. that's your, your yeah so all your identity your digital identity is nearly determining what's going on around you and sure what's happening then is all these news feeds on social are all also determined on what you like and you're that's why i'm saying we're moving away from demographics because no they're saying or you're into fashion, or you're into beauty, or whatever, and we'll give you all that content. Which is why, if you see with the whole thing with Trump and Brexit and stuff like that, it's and there's a part of me thinks it's not really Mark Zuckerberg's fault. You know, yes, he should have better controls over fake news, but at the same time, we'll we'll read what we want to read. It's a sure, bit like people like. watch tabloids for years. Yeah. People read yeah, tabloids. 
you know, and most of it is, a lot of it is oh, fake news. What, what, what do you think then is uh, your view on like the Facebook timeline and how they've mm. limited to what you're seeing now? Like, I, I have actually two questions for you. One is, one is that, and the second one, what's your view on, say, a business that has 5,000 likes, it's a business page on Facebook, Yeah. but they're only getting like two or 300 people seeing their stuff. Should yeah. they not, if those people initially like that page, should, should that business not be entitled to have it there? They should, but what's happening is, it's like you anything. Pay for it. Years ago, I remember when we were first doing this with Fota, the organic reach on a post, you'd get about 50 to 60% on everything, like easily. Sometimes you get way more than that. If you had a really successful post, you were getting two, three, four times the amount of, of, of people that liked the page that saw it. What happened is, with more and more businesses coming in, it's all about time. And now you have competition. So it's not just Facebook. It's Instagram, it's LinkedIn, it's Snapchat, it's WhatsApp, all of that. So you have limited number of hours that you can look at content. You follow about a thousand brands because over the years you've liked this, 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 this. What you really only end up seeing is the stuff that you really engage with. So there's a reason why organic reach is poor. It's just there's not Ooh, physically enough room. Yeah, and because your attention you're, pan. Yeah, because you're competing with your mother, your father now, they're all in it. You're competing with the brothers and sisters, you're competing with the next door neighbor. All of those, so the, so brands are competing with people, and if you look at that, the algorithm, usually, if you look at the news feed, for example, on Facebook, you'll be lucky to see one organic post from a business in the first 10 posts that you see. You'll see three, probably, ads. You'll see a news company of some sort, but the rest will be dominated by friends and family, because at the end of the day, if he overpopulates that with business, he loses the customer sure so like I, I, like we're the product people are the product so businesses want to target us but at the same time for him to have the product there he needs to keep them all happy he otherwise they're gone. As well. so he needs to make sure that news feed and they're always updating the news feed and they're changing it all the time and yeah like i mean it's 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 really interesting but i think businesses need to focus on okay if we've had a really engaging story how do we get more of those type of stories? You know, stop selling, start talking. Giving content, giving yeah. value. Stop, the, sell, the sales will happen. I always feel, I always felt that like if you had a 21 rule kind of like, so 95% of your time as such, you should be telling the story. And then 5%, when you have something decent to sell, you stick That's that in there. That's the, uh, the Gary Vaynerchuk, yeah. jab, jab, right hook, isn't it? So like, because otherwise people are just gonna, here they go Too again. Too sell. Yeah, here they go again, they're trying yeah. to sell me something yeah. else. Uh, and then, so after Red FM, like, did you always, because I know you set up a new business, yeah. uh, 24 Stories. Yeah, so I set up, I suppose I set up two businesses. I had it always in my mind. So I obviously have a consulting business called Narration, which is ideal one-to-one -one with businesses. A bit of mentoring and that type of stuff as well. And I do workshops and training and, 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 and all of that. And then I always had it in my mind, I felt that there was a gap in the market for continuous learning. But learning in a nice environment, a small niche kind of environment with the odd big event. So I suppose I've been lucky enough for the last couple of years to be teaching loads and loads of students and mainly post-grad. So I've been in CIT for the last five years. So even when I was in Fort and Red, I was lecturing part-time. So I was lecturing on this uh, certificate in digital marketing, which ended up being a master's and met some fantastic people who have all done great stuff themselves in industry. And I felt, you know, a lot of them kind of felt sad when they were leaving because they had kind of built you know, friendships and stuff like that. And I said, wouldn't it be great to have a place where they could go? And that there wasn't just an event kind of every kind of two or three months, but there was regular events. So I created uh, 24 Stories and the idea was that to mix people. So the, at the core of 24 Stories is, is a kind of a membership. It's a 12 month membership whereby you get to um, go to eight talks in a year. You get to do four workshops and two conferences. So the first conference is coming up. But... What, what it is, is 20, where, where 24 comes from is, I felt when I was teaching over the years, if a class was around 24 in size, usually you get a lot more conversation going because people feel comfortable. They get to know someone, it goes back to like the school classroom size again. It's like primary school, kind of that type of environment. So they get to know everyone. They get to know them by first name, that type of stuff. But again, they don't feel shy. So I wanted to create an environment where there'd be 24 people, but obviously everyone is not going to attend every event. So I wanted to create four categories where they'd mix. And I felt that wouldn't it be lovely 
to get students to make with, mix with businesses because always you get these students and they they come out into the workplace and they don't know how it's to very hard to engage. transfer what they've yeah. learned in the book to actually real life and they Whereas realize yeah yeah so they get to sit in in the room with other people that maybe are doing it themselves at the moment so i've the, the idea is just four categories 24 students 24 graduates because i felt you know they're just coming out of college uh, then you have 24 individuals and 24 businesses and it's a tiered scheme so the student pays a lot less than the business but you can stay a student forever yeah. so yeah. you know you work your way up just like in life and you also in, i seen you invite businesses in yeah like so a workshop yeah. For them or a yeah so it, it's like giving back as well so that it, that was another idea like we do a lot I, we've dealt with over a hundred businesses in CIT in the last couple of years on the different marketing um, courses that we run and they love it and I felt wouldn't it be lovely to do more of these kind of small little snips, kind of snippet ones as well whereby I could bring a business in they could tell their story and without anyone knowing who they are beforehand people giving back free advice and they are learning and people are learning from each other so we do a thing called startup story and where we have the business coming in and they talk for about five or ten minutes and then for the next kind of half an hour people are giving the ideas back and like i give each business 24 tips to take away hopefully they'll find some of them useful and there's been a really great discussion and the great thing is students will have a completely different perspective than somebody maybe that's been there done that bought the t-shirt a business owner mm. for example and it's 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 just nice so i'm taking the best elements from from i suppose some of the courses that i've been teaching on and kind of packaging them for industry so that people get to to, to ex taste this going forward and uh, i think you have a big event coming up have you so I do. can you explain what, what exactly happening at the minute is it actually coincidentally it's in photo is it it is so it's obviously not in the wildlife park yeah. uh, <laughs> so it's not with the tigers or the, uh, the lions oh, with the cheetahs <laughs> you know, that could have been a bit too risky but uh, i have had conferences when i was there but they uh, you know uh, i'm going back next door uh, so going to the uh, the resort and i suppose the idea will be it's um it's kind of positioned in two things. So the morning is like a, your traditional conference, keynote speakers, um, including. So um, I have a guy coming over from Copenhagen, um, uh, Chris Kubernus, um, regarded by Forbes as one of the um, best business people on, on Snapchat, uh, but a huge what, following on Instagram. It on? So it's on the 22nd of March, uh, it's, just, it's a Friday. We'll try get this out in around then, hopefully go to Yeah, like hopefully, notice, yeah. Right? Um, so the 22nd of March, um, so we have him, uh, we have a guy called uh, David Petterick, he's also known as Dr. LinkedIn, works with people all over the UK um, on, on kind of improving their LinkedIn profiles to get better positions, but also to get sales and stuff like that. And then um, we're going to have really interesting panels. Uh, I see some local entrepreneurs yeah, and business people. Yeah, so that. one is about building a brand in, in the digital age, and I'll have Pat Feeling. And Deirdre Cochran from Chapter, yeah, who's been on, on. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I'm going to have one on video then, because like, it's interesting we're doing a video here as well today. Um, I think like video has become so powerful, but at the same time, I want to say what really makes things go viral, but with a, with a slant of creativity. So I have Brendan Canty in, who made the video for Hosier, that, that basically shot him to fame, take me to church, it was all made here in Cork. I have uh, Billy Cummings, who is who has worked with Ed Sheeran recently. Wow! Um, is that are you? Does those event because the scale of this now seems to have been growing. Yeah. So does that does that excite you? Are you nervous? Oh yeah! Like is I mean, like, there's 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 the, being nervous because, because you'd be you'd be afraid that you know am I going too big too quick? But at the same time, and um, like there's a serious business element as well. You yes, know, it has to make money. It has you know? to make money. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and and that's the thing. I suppose that's the great thing about the membership of 24 stories because they get free tickets anyway because they're members so in some ways it takes away some of the pressure okay. because that in a sense it's never been about making loads of money from the membership that's kind of like a crowdfunding type of thing to enable me to bring great speakers to Cork. Sure. That's kind of the idea. Sure. So the smaller events are more like a networking, a kind of a case study thing with the, with the startups. Community this driven. now is kind of a bit bigger I mean, we're flying over Vogue Williams as well from London. And like, I mean, I really want to talk to Vogue about, she did a really interesting documentary on the whole influencer marketing thing earlier in the year and how that industry has just gone massive. And, and, and I want to see, is it a bubble? 
And I want to see, is it above the what, smoke What do you think? Do you think, because, like, obviously, you know, and it just this week or something, there's something about Instagram, where yeah. accounts are yeah. used, and people can buy followers and all that mm. kind of thing. So I think we spoke about briefly about being authentic on social media. Uh, and we all know about the White Moose Cafe and Paul yeah. Stenson and who he's called out yes. people before. Yeah. What, what are your thoughts on in, 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 using an influencer as uh, to promote your product? And, like, it, do you think it's effective? Depending on your industry, I think. I can see, obviously, anyone that's in beauty, in fashion, it's a no-brainer. Absolute no-brainer because, I mean, it's very visual and they're willing to put themselves in those clothes or try in the cosmetics or whatever. So I can see the effects of it. Um, but if I was a brand, I'd be, I'd be making sure that you do your research on those people first and make sure they are who they, they say they are and that they actually have the right audience. Because it's say for example, you're doing a product, a fashion product, and your main core audience is, is, is a mom with young kids or whatever, and you're looking at kids' clothing, and you take on somebody, but maybe all the following is in their early 20s, and they don't have can any, you, ask, you know. Can you ask influencers to send you algorithms or send you like... They can, the, they have the to. Yeah, yeah, and they're all looking for verification you now as well. Most audience. of them are represented by agencies now and stuff as well, okay. so like, I mean, big that, business now, it's a it? big business, yeah. a huge business. But again, there's a part of me thinks, is, is it a bit like, um, bit like anything, um, like Facebook, for example. In the early days of Facebook, all the businesses were doing really well because there was very few of them on it. No businesses are struggling, like we said, will go. Will we see the same thing happen with, with the likes of Instagram, with influencers? Because if there's too many people think that they're an influencer, Will they actually drag dilute down? Dilute the market. Yeah, they just they dilute yeah. it, and the volume. You what you get is you get the cream coming to the top. Yeah. I honestly believe that. Yeah. And they'll be so way way ahead of the rest of them, I'd say, uh, and the rest will probably fall off. There's been talk, for example, people are buying products just to uh, they're buying the products and reviewing them to kind of show that they are influencers when they're actually not. They're not you know, it's not getting paid for yeah, the, the not endorsement. Paid. So it's you know. It's a bit of a crazy world, but yeah. you see young kids nowadays and they want to be vloggers and yeah. stuff, you know. Yeah, YouTubers. Yeah. You know, so, you know, that's not something that was said 10 yeah. years ago, but. Where, yeah, where, so where do you see um, social media with businesses going? So, like, like people are saying Facebook is dying, but there's something like 1.2 billion new users in the last month or yeah. something, or some crazy figure came out. Um, like, and then Instagram, is that taking over? Like, where, where is the attention shifting to? So Instagram has definitely grown in the last year. So Ipsos bring out some... So Bebo's definitely gone, is it? Bebo's gone. <laughs> Forget about it. They did try to make a comeback. Yeah. The original founder yeah. actually bought it back from AOL. Okay. It, it just failed. Yeah. I think he bought yeah. it back, which yeah. is a hobby, it's So fa Facebook is still very strong, though, isn't it? Facebook's still the number one. I yeah. mean, Facebook, just put it into perspective in terms of audience share, Facebook is twice anything else, at least. Sometimes it's three times. So if you're looking at Ireland at the moment, it has taken a small dip, but there's still about, you're talking about 66% of the country have an account, you know, two thirds, and of that, about 63% of them are using it every day. So still by far the biggest. The next biggest to that is Instagram. And Instagram is at about 34, 35% users in terms of the population. Of that, about 60, 60 to 70 percent are using it every day so it's it, there's a big gap between them and then the rest go way down so something like linkedin for example you're looking at about about 27 28 percent of the population have an account but only about 10 percent of them use it every day so it's a way it's a lot smaller because it's a niche yeah, you know what? It's more uh, yeah, it's, corporate it's business, corporate and, yeah. and stuff. Yeah, um, it's nearly becoming a recruitment tool, isn't it? It's yeah. a lot of agencies are using it now to advertise roles and recruit oh, from. Oh, it. without a doubt. Well, yeah. I think it was always that. I think yeah, where it's really strong is sales. Yeah. Like sales is yeah. really like I think if you're in high end sales and you're trying to target individuals, that's yeah. probably where you need yeah. to be. Um, I think the future though, what's really interesting, we've seen the shift in the last couple of years is there's a lot of activity online now going private again. It was very public for a while, and now lots of people communicate with their friends in small private chats. And in particular, the biggest growth in the last couple of years has been WhatsApp. So WhatsApp is now the biggest platform in the country. So something like three quarters, about 75% of the population have an account. And about 70% So do you think then there's a potential for some advertising to go into a WhatsApp setup? Yeah, well, they're, they're going to change that in the next couple of years. I mean, there's talks that they're going to merge WhatsApp with Facebook Messenger. 
Um, you know, obviously. Allow for that. Yeah, yeah and game. Zuckerberg owns obviously all of them, and um, the fact that he bought that for fifteen billion and really hasn't monetized it in any way. Um, there has been fines in place because uh, with the EU and stuff in relation to them sharing information of that of users, but they've never advertised on the platform. I always felt that from a business perspective, that could be a fantastic tool to maybe charge a premium to talk to customers. I thought that would be one for them. And maybe that will be in the future. But I yeah. definitely think where Facebook is really, really strong is customer service. Not so much as a sales tool, response but, but response to keep your customers. So if you can hold on to your customers there, very cost effective way of getting your message out there because very few of them are opening emails. So, I mean, only certain products get opened in an email, like, I mean, flights and stuff, people are, will look at that type of stuff. But if you're trying to sell whatever, washing machines or whatever, they're not probably going to open it, realistically. Yeah, the, the day the email newsletter is dead now. There's too many of them. We yeah. kill the market. Well, well, Stephen, thank you very much for no joining us today. It's been a really fascinating conversation. Uh, we really wish you the best of luck. Thanks with your continuing much. lecturing job and your 24 stories yeah. and the huge event that's coming up. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm sure we're going to hear lots more from the future. Thanks, Will. Thank, thank you. Thank you.